the states with the biggest increase in gun laws have the biggest relative increases in murder rates. That factor seems to be overwhelmed by the ways in which right to carry laws increase uh, violent crime. They don't want to get paid by people who are involved in the gun debate. Welcome back to In Sickness and in Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. Guns are an emotional issue in the U.S. They're tied up in culture, sport, and as we've seen in previous episodes, with identity and what it means to be an American. And there's a deeply held belief that guns make us safer. To a lot of people, it's just common sense. Simply brandishing a gun is sufficient to cause a criminal to break off an attack. But common sense doesn't always play out when we look at the numbers. That is, when there are good numbers on guns and crime. You know, that, that would be a wonderful number to have. I wasn't really able to get much data after that. It's unclear whether it happens, you know, hundreds of times. There's no reason those mistakes should be there. Thousands of times a year or, or somewhat more. For a number of reasons, there's a lack of good data on guns in America. And that leads to a lot of debate about what can really be said on the topic at a macro scale. In today's episode, we're going to take a good, hard look at some of the studies on guns and crime. What do the numbers say? What are the gaps in our knowledge? Can we come to an agreement on whether guns can really make us safer? There's no way to have a conversation about guns and public safety in America without this guy. If an attack does occur, uh, it turns out the safest course of action for a victim to take when they're confronted by a criminal is to have a gun. This is John Lott. Guns obviously make it easier for bad things to happen, but they also make it easier for people to protect themselves and prevent bad things from happening. Lott is an economist and the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. But before that, he was a professor at the University of Chicago, who was asked by his students to talk to them about gun regulation. I'd read some papers in the area, but, uh, and they were really bad, but I just assumed I hadn't really looked much at the literature. It turns out pretty much everything that was done at that time was pretty poorly done. This was back in the 1990s. Lott saw that the studies at the time looked at guns in one of two ways. Either they were comparing two countries' experiences with guns, say the U.S. and the U.K., or they were focusing on just one place over a period of time. And all the studies up until that point had been one of those two types of studies. But this isn't a great way to get at the impact of different policies in different places and contexts over time. For one, it's difficult to know what's really going on if you can't isolate all the factors that could be influencing outcomes. And it's only by having enough experiments in enough different years that you can hopefully disentangle uh, these things that are going on there. And that's, that's called panel data. Okay, bear with me here. Panel data is when you look at multiple dimensions of information over a period of time. Maybe you've heard of a longitudinal study that's basically the same thing. For example, we might look at the impact of smoking on lung cancer, not at one point in time, but over a lifetime. As part of such a study, we'd also want details on other factors that might increase someone's risk of lung cancer, like exposure to secondhand smoke or having worked as a minor. The way to solve these problems is essentially to combine time series and cross-sectional data where you're following lots of jurisdictions over time to see how the murder rate or violent crime rate is changing before and after there's a change in the law, and to see how it's changing relative to other places that aren't changing their laws. And if you have enough places that change their laws in enough different years, uh, then you can begin to disentangle things, hopefully, a little. So kind of like you'd study many people who smoke, who used to smoke, and who never smoked, how much they smoked, and if they got lung cancer. 
Similarly, Lott set out to study gun regulations. He looked at the years between 1977 and 1992. Specifically, he looked at crime in the eight states that passed right to carry laws, compared with the states that didn't. The results of that study set off a bombshell in the gun debate. The reason why I ended up focusing on right to carry laws was because it's the only one that seemed to make a difference in what was going on in terms of crime rates. It wasn't just that cr violent crime rates fell uh, after you passed right to carry laws, but what you found is that the longer uh, the law was in existence, you saw a bigger drop, and in particular, uh, it was related to the changing share of the population with concealed carry permits. If you believe that, uh, you know, the greater the risk to the criminal, and that greater risk is going to be related to the likelihood that they'll run into somebody who's able to go and defend themselves, uh, if, as that increases, you see, should see greater deterrence. Lott's hypothesis boiled down to more guns, less crime. That's the name of the book he went on to publish in 1998 while he was working at the University of Chicago. Right to carry laws, also known as shall issue laws, mean you don't need to demonstrate, quote, good cause to get a license to carry a concealed firearm. Lott found that the states that adopted right to carry laws saw a drop in murder rates compared to states without right to carry. His research also saw a reduction in violent crime, basically crimes between two people, like a robbery or an assault. The question is, why should that be the case? And what you see, what I would argue, is that, again, it's related to the probability that somebody's going to be able to stop a crime from occurring. Think of Lott's work as the statistical basis for the idea of the good guy with a gun. Yeah, I mean, the, the Lott thesis was um, if more law-abiding citizens were carrying guns, they could thwart crime when they were accosted by a criminal. And there certainly are examples of that happening. Um, but that factor seems to be um, overwhelmed by the ways in which right-to-carry laws uh, facilitate or increase uh, violent crime. This is John Donahue. Yeah, and I am a professor of law at Stanford Law School and also a uh, research uh, associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. If John Lott made a name for himself saying more guns equals less crime, John Donahue made his by saying the opposite. He did a econometric evaluation of the uh, uh, impact on crime of the adoption of that law in those eight states and came to the conclusion that right to carry laws actually reduced crime. And so this created quite a stir. And um, uh, I've been sort of looking at that question almost ever since. One of the biggest issues Donahue has with Lott's work is the impact of crack cocaine. Our most serious problem today is cocaine and in particular, crack. Rock has become the drug of choice in this area in the past six months, a costly high that lures users into crime. You think it's the glamour drug of the 80s? Well, that's the point of this fronted little reminder. It can kill you. It's as innocent looking as candy, but it's turning our cities into battle zones. Just yesterday, it was revealed that crime was way up. Between the early 1980s and the early 1990s, the U.S. was racked by the crack cocaine epidemic at precisely the same time that violent crime was shooting up. Study after study has shown that crack and the homicide rate were closely intertwined. The problem that it created was that the original eight states that a lot looked at were largely rural states. States like Montana, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Maine. And their experience with crack was very different from states like uh, Illinois or uh, New York or California that did have a big crack problem. And these crack states were states that did not have right to carry laws. So when Lott did his analysis, uh, he found that crime rose more in the states that did not adopt right to carry laws than it did in the eight states that did. 
but it was really a, a, a crack phenomenon that was explaining that differential rather than the adoption of a right to carry law restraining a, a crime increase. John Lott again. He can go and argue whatever he wants to about cocaine, but it's there's like five different ways I had dealt with it before he even uh, claimed that I hadn't dealt with it. We had gotten data on uh, cocaine prices by county in the United States over time. We didn't have it over the full period, but we had it over most of the time period that we looked at. The way Lott tried to control for the impact of crack on crime was through prices. Donahue says this would be like doing a study on car accidents and using the price of cars as a surrogate for the number of cars in a particular state. You might have that data, but Donahue argues the price doesn't really tell you anything. You know, it's one thing if Donahue had gone and argued that, look, Lott and Mustard tried to deal with cocaine. I don't think they dealt with it right. Uh, I would have done it differently. That would have been one thing to go and argue. But that's not what he argued. He kept on arguing, and I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, if you've looked through his papers, he's argued over and over again that, that we haven't dealt with it. And, uh, you know, and my 98 paper with Broenars, one of the reasons why we sent it up is, well, long before Donahue brought up the objection about cocaine, John Lott is talking about a 1998 paper he did after his book More Guns, Less Crime came out. In this study, he and Stephen Broners looked at counties on either side of state borders, where one state had right to carry and the other didn't. That was the paper that had looked at these adjacent counties on opposite sides of state borders. Well, if you have two urban counties right next to each other, adjacent, touching each other, and we'd also done it in terms of you know, how far the centers of the counties were from each other, whether they were within five miles or ten miles of each other. Um, you know, you have two urban counties where the centers of the cities are within five miles or ten miles. You're going to, you know, if you have a crack cocaine epidemic in one urban county, you're going to see it in the other one. That is actually uh, another terrible lot paper, the lot and donors paper. John Donahue where uh, he, he tried to make it seem like he was comparing what was happening on one side of the, the line versus another. The way he did the analysis, he was, he was not comparing you know, one side of the line to the other. And it was really a, a crazy analysis. It aggregated all of the other uh, areas outside the uh, particular right to carry state rather than looked directly across the state line. Well, it makes it seem like, um, yeah, if, we're, if we have a right to carry law, all the bad guys are, are going to run away and, and, you know, maybe they'll cross the border and start doing their crime there. What I have found is that the bad guys arm themselves more extensively. So rather than run away, they stay where they are, but they just make sure they're carrying guns. And so as a result, you see um, the percentage of robberies committed with, uh, with weapons rises in the aftermath of right to carry adoption. And we, saw, and we see no decrease in the number of robberies. Lott also cites shootings in gun-free zones, places like schools, movie theaters, and places of worship, as further evidence that guns deter crime. You know, you look at uh, the Aurora Batman movie theater shooting. Seven movie theaters within a 20-minute drive to the killer's apartment. Only one of them that were showing the premiere of the Batman movie, only one of them had posted signs banning permit concealed handguns. So last uh, year, uh, we had the synagogue shooting in uh, Pittsburgh, another gun-free zone, by the way. Donahue thinks this line of thinking gets it backwards. By analogy, does carrying an umbrella increase the chance of rain? Or do you grab an umbrella when you leave the house because you heard it's supposed to rain later? Louis Clarivas uh, has researched uh, mass shootings and, and he shows that uh, the factors that usually explain uh, uh, mass shootings are uh, a place that somebody has uh, a particular gripe against. So either a school that they uh, feel they were mistreated at or a workplace. Uh, and uh, 
the, the mass shootings that are done in public are usually uh, um, focused on some particular uh, uh, grievance or, or target that seems to be unrelated to whether it's a gun-free zone or not. Does making a building a gun-free zone increase the probability of a shooting? Or are certain places designated gun-free because they're known to be higher risk? The NRA position is, uh, you know, we're better off if we arm more people and allow, uh, uh, you know, the populace to be walking around with, with guns. The extension of that position is that there shouldn't be any areas where you're not allowed to carry guns because uh, we may invite uh, more criminal activity in the so-called gun-free zones. Take, for instance, the ultimate gun-free zone, airports and airplanes. Has making them gun-free zones increased the likelihood of violent crime? In 2005, the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council looked at Lott's research on more guns, less crime. The council's report arrived at a very unsatisfying answer, that there was, quote, no credible evidence that the passage of right-to-carry laws decreases or increases violent crime. The council basically said Lott's argument that more guns equals less crime might or might not be true, but until we have better data, we won't know. So in 1999 and in 2002, 2003, 2011, 2014, and again in 2018, John Donahue tried to do just that. He replicated Lott's analysis and conducted his own. And with each study, he had more and better data at his disposal. So what did Donahue find? Right to carry laws were associated with increases in crime, generally in the neighborhood of you know, one to one and a half percent per year after adoption, so that by the end of, uh, you know, a 10-year period after adopting a right to carry law, your uh, uh, average state seemed to have about a 13 to 15 percent increase in violent crime over what it would have had had there been no adoption of the right to carry law. As much as a 15 percent increase in violent crime in states with right to carry laws. That's 180 degrees from Lott's findings. So what would explain such a big gap in the findings? We already mentioned the role of crack cocaine. How did Donahue get such different results? I simply tried to follow the same sort of protocol that he had engaged in, but now with a richer data set. Lott looked at data from eight right to carry states. Donahue's sample size was much bigger. 33 states. He also looked at data from those states over a longer period of time. Lott's study followed 15 years. Donahue's covered 35. So just having a lot more data uh, made it a, a, a more effective study. So if crack cocaine was such a big issue in Lott's work, how did Donahue deal with it? So uh, I just thought, uh, uh, why not... Uh, sort of take crack out of the equation entirely and just look at 2000 on. And of course, that has benefits and costs, which is literally always the case in this empirical study. The benefit is that we were taking out a confounding variable that uh, no one had a good quantitative control for. Only eight states adopted right to carry in the post-2000 period that I looked at, and so that wasn't ideal. But of course, when Rod wrote his initial paper, only eight states had adopted right to carry. There was something else Donahue's research pointed to. States with right to carry laws had higher rates of incarceration. Yes, yes. You know, probably one of the most amazing socioeconomic phenomena in the United States in the last 50 years was the enormous drop in crime that we got in the 1990s. Why this happened is still being debated. But one thing people point to is mass incarceration. The war on drugs drove a fourfold increase in incarceration rates starting in the early 1970s. Research predicts that if you double the prison population, you get about a 15% drop in crime. In this case, when 
um, my study suggested that right to carry laws would increase violent crime by f about 15 percent. It shows you that uh, uh, to address uh, a factor that elevated crime by that magnitude, you'd need to essentially double your prison population to get us back to where you were had you not uh, adopted a right to carry law. So in a sense, you know, are people less free um, in states where you have a right to carry law, given what happens to the prison population? Yes. And, and uh, essentially what has happened is uh, that uh, the states that have adopted right to carry laws uh, have experienced an increase in violent crime because of it, but they've tried to moderate that increase by uh, growing their police force and and locking up more people. It feels like Lott and Donahue don't have much in common, but there's a high price to pay if you want to study guns in America, regardless of where on the political spectrum you find yourself. One of the reasons why there's so much debate about this kind of research is the lack of good data. Seemingly basic information, like how many concealed carry permit holders are in a given state, or if a concealed carry holder was involved in a crime, aren't available. The NRA has, has made the job of researchers much tougher by getting all sorts of laws passed to restrict uh, access to data that would be helpful or to prevent federal funding of research in this area. So as you look at the big picture, you, you assume that the, the forces that are trying to keep uh, uh, people in the dark uh, have something to hide. So I, I sort of take that as a sign that the NRA crowd knows that if the truth comes out, uh, this will not be helpful to their goals and ambitions. Even Lott has a hard time getting data for his research. I know some mid-level people in the NRA that I've tried to get data from and stuff like that over time, you know, things like NRA membership by state. They initially shared data with me. I wasn't really able to get much data after that. Remember the Dickey Amendment we talked about in the first episode of this season? That 1996 legislation has prevented the CDC from funding research into gun violence. Donahue says he's gotten grants from the National Science Foundation, and his research has been supported by the universities where he's worked. Lott, too, struggles with funding. I have not received any funding uh, from the NRA. I've not received any funding from any gun maker or, uh, you know, manufacturer of ammunition or anything like that. And the reason why I haven't done it is because, um, you know, I, uh, I want to be able to say that my work hasn't been biased. Lott told me his nonprofit, the Crime Prevention Research Center, accepts donations from individuals. It also accepts grants from organizations like the Bradley Foundation, which is definitely a hard right organization. The foundation is dedicated to the, quote, struggle against the forces of tyranny, a common refrain in pro-gun circles. Then there's a certain level of harassment gun researchers face. Donahue. It is a challenging area to work because the, uh, the intensity and the you know, near religious fervor on the gun side uh, often means that if you say anything that the, uh, the gun crowd doesn't like, they're, they're very angry, hostile, and of course armed. Uh, and so when you're, when you're dealing with angry, hostile, and armed individuals, there, there's always a certain level of discomfort. Lott says he was basically run out of academia because of his research. Chicago would continue paying my salary through the end of the year, uh, but that I had to leave. That there was basically no way that I could stay at Yale. I couldn't get another academic job, uh, basically because people knew that I would get attacked by politicians for doing the research that I was doing. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to go into it more, but it's just, those are just some of the things that did happen. Donahue and other critics of Lott draw parallels between Lott and climate change skeptics. 
they say, even though the research we have now shows that at best, right to carry laws may not increase crime, there's an audience out there for contrarian views. At least in the climate change world, um, you're, you're dealing with a, a simpler concept because the physical world actually is easier to uh, model than the, uh, the human behavioral world. We have, you know, perfect data on, uh, you know, temperatures and all of these factors, you know, CO2 emissions that go into the, the climate science. Um, so it is it is easier. And you also have hundreds or thousands of top scientists working on that question. The gun area is a little different because the data is, is weaker. Um, and uh, the number of people who work in this area is more limited. A lot of people just say, I don't need the the headache and, and, you know, the implicit danger that attaches um, to uh, saying anything that the NRA and the gun crowd don't like. So what you get is some really second-rate work along the lines of some of the challengers to climate science. The climate change analogy here uh, works, I think, as well, uh, that as long as you can cast doubt on the the good work, uh, you achieve uh, an important goal for the people who are trying to move uh, either the country or policy in, in a way that's consistent with the bad research rather than the good research. Just as the majority of researchers say the science shows climate change to be real, the majority of gun violence experts, including Donahue, say their research shows more guns lead to more crime. I think that, uh, um, you know, my current paper is the best study available on what the impact of, of right to carry laws is on, on crime, but um, that certainly won't keep the, uh, uh, you know, the, the gun crowd from trying to uh, poke holes in it and... Uh, We'll, we'll just see in the fullness of time uh, who, who prevails in the academic world versus who prevails in the political world. Lott's views on guns weren't well received in academia, but regardless of what his colleagues think of his work, an increasing number of politicians, especially on the right, leverage Lott's research in support of their views. The number of right to carry states continues to grow. I think it's easier to overestimate the impact that anybody has. It's probably true for my work. I don't think it's had as much impact as some people claim. In fact, the latest trend is permitless carry, which means someone of any age can legally carry a loaded gun without a license or permit. Vermont was always a permitless carry state. Alaska made the switch in 2003. And since 2010, over a dozen states have gone to permitless carry, and most of those also allow open carry. We're going to have more information on this shortly. If you look at violent crime after Alaska went to permitless carry, which was quite some time ago, violent crime rose very substantially after that. Uh, so I, I suspect we're going to see this. These changing laws are natural experiments, further tests of Lott's hypothesis, more guns, less crime. We could very well see some even bigger changes in gun regulations in the years to come. The Supreme Court recently decided to hear its first major gun rights case in almost a decade. This case, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus New York, could potentially allow permitless carry nationwide and one of Donahue's former students will soon get to weigh in. Now, Kavanaugh's on the Supreme Court. He was in the economics class I taught at Yale when he was an undergraduate. But not in the direction Donahue's research would point. We may be in a situation where the Supreme Court uh, strikes down every gun regulation in America on Second Amendment grounds which is what uh, my former student, Brett Kavanaugh, seems to want to do based on his uh, earlier decision as a uh, uh, D.C. Court of Appeals judge in 
uh, which uh, he, he would have voted to strike down the assault weapon ban, uh, probably the uh, high capacity magazine ban, and, and the registration of guns in the District of Columbia. In this business, what you ultimately come to realize is for many politicians and legislators and even judges, what matters is not what is the best science. What matters is, um, is there something that looks like science that I can use to support the position that I want to reach? Donahue and others have discredited Lott's research, yet Lott continues to have an outsized influence in the American gun debates. In our next episode, we'll keep delving into the research on whether guns make us safer or not. We'll delve specifically into self-defense and guns, when and how people use guns in self-defense, and how that plays out. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Zach Dyer and me. Our theme music is by Alan Best. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and In Health.